Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the New Ground Life and Leadership podcast. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Dr. Lizzie Ling. Uh, Dr. Ling worked as a family doctor for many years and is now the Associate Minister for Women at St. Ebb's Church in Oxford. And in 2020, uh, as part of the Talking Point series, Lizzie published the book Abortion, along with Vaughan Roberts, which you can see here, those watching the video, and uh, re would recommend buying these. Um, Lizzie, it's such a, or Dr. Ling, I don't know what you want me to call you. But... No, Lizzie, Lizzie, Lizzie. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a privilege to have you with us. Thanks so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Um, so we are going to be talking about something that is um, culturally a hot potato, we might say, uh, and also something that needs to be handled with a lot of sensitivity and grace. And that's what I really appreciate about your book um, on abortion. It, it is very humane, very gracious, and yet also very clear on your own position and what you think the Bible has to say about this. Um, so we just wanted to say that at the front end, really, for, for those listening, that uh, this isn't, we recognise this isn't a discussion about ideas so much as it is a discussion about um, just the painful realities and complexities of living in a fallen world with difficult choices all around that we need to make and with making decisions that have consequences for our lives. Um, so, Lizzie, I know that you're going to handle this subject with, with the kind of compassion and grace that I've heard you talk before and you, you do in your writing. Um, but as we kind of come into it, why don't we just start with the, the question that we were beginning to talk about before we pressed record? And that is just around the whole, whole uh, background to why you came to wrote, write the book in the first place and why this became and has become such an important issue for you. Yeah, I've got to say, really, that it hasn't always been such an important issue. Um, actually, I think my interaction with the topic goes back uh, many years, really, to medical school. Um, and I remember being in a lecture at medical school um, by a guy called David Payton. And David was influential in the 1967 Abortion Act. Um, he was a very gentle man, a very sincere man. Um, uh, and a man who, in some ways, I, could res I, I respected greatly. Um, uh, but a man who was definitely pro-abortion and wanted to see the law changed. And then a couple of years later, I was in the operating theatre with him when he was performing a late abortion. And I was so aware of the conflict between the violence of the procedure, uh, but the sincerity of this man. Um, and so I was really unsettled. I really couldn't uh, understand. And I, we, I think we have to admit that there are very sincere people on the other side of the debate to us even if we might profoundly disagree, or I would profoundly disagree with them. So I was aware as I went into my medical career, I guess, that I wasn't happy with this issue, um, but I didn't really think it all through. Um, I could skirt around it and kind of get involved, um, uh, but not involved. I wouldn't sign abortion forms as a GP, that sort of pricked my conscience. The fact of the matter though, I wasn't a Christian at that time. <laughs> Um, but it was really when I became a Christian during my life as a GP that things started to change. Um, and in fact, it wasn't that I, I, I turned my back on sort of the abortion topic. In fact, I probably engaged even more sincerely with it because I saw the difficulties that women found themselves in when they came to me requesting an abortion. Um, and my heart was moved. I could see the dilemmas that they faced with unexpected pregnancy. Um, and yet I knew that in some way, well, I knew that abortion was not going to be the best solution. It was unlikely to be the best solution for them, I felt at the time. Now I think I'd almost go too far as to say that it is never the best solution, uh, even in, in, in a woman's experience. Um, uh, on the bigger scale of things, I think abortion really does leave a mark on a woman's life. Um, it's something so profound and fundamental that we're doing against our being made in the image of God as women when we have an abortion that it's bound to leave its mark but anyway that's others would disagree with me and um, put that aside um, I found myself actually perhaps spending more time with women uh, requesting abortions than perhaps my colleagues um, um, because I wanted them to explore the topic and to make sure they really did have a as much as they could a choice to make their mind up properly with all the facts um, and give them the time to do that because I think when women are find themselves unexpectedly pregnant um it's such a shock you just want to sort the problem out as quickly as possible and the easy default is to think abortion and in fact then you know you're left to ruminate on that decision for years later sometimes and you want to make sure that as far as for that woman 
she feels she has made the right decision at the time. So I, I became I invested in that uh, a little bit more as a GP, I guess, um, but when I became a Christian. Um, but still, I hadn't really thought things through until there was a guy called Dave Brennan pitched up in Oxford. And uh, he's from an organisation called Brefos, who's a pro-life organisation. Um, and he presented a seminar to, for church leaders. It was um, uh, on just raising awareness, saying, you know, where is the church in this? That kind of thing. I guess it was quite telling that there were only two of us there, <laughs> but I was one of them. Wow. And, um, and that really challenged me. Um, Dave uses a lot of imagery in his presentations, which sometimes I find um, a bit uncomfortable. So my visceral reaction, and I think lots of people have that, but he and others like him would argue that actually um, the imagery and the pictures are powerful. And that was certainly my experience. That's, that's what triggered me to think, no, something really needs to be done about this. And in fact, I came back to church and uh, Vaughan Roberts, who's the pastor, um, he'd actually asked me to go on this seminar, um, uh, asked me to present a seminar to the church. And as I had to think through these things and process what Dave had said, I guess I sort of, I guess that I brought my own nuance to how to present and think about the issue. Um, and um, yeah, so we had ran a seminar at church and then because um, a good book company who published the talking book series and Vaughan have worked together as this in this sort of talking point series, um, I, it was suggested that I, that I, and Vaughan put this book together. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of these books is just to get churches talking really um, and to provide tools for conversations to happen uh, mm -hmm. within congregations. So I hope that's, I, I hope that's where it's gonna be helpful, yeah. yeah. Excellent. You mentioned um, coming down to that seminar, there's only two of you there. Um, yeah. How, how have you found the reaction to the book? Is, is the church largely silent on issues that it should be talking? And, and perhaps what are some of your reflections on why the church might be silent or not speaking or thinking much about this issue um, and yeah then subsequently what's the reaction been to to your book since it's come out um i think um i think it's a hard topic to talk about it's really hard and i think we need a framework to do it and often people have not had the time to think it through um, it's such a sensitive tissue uh, issue, so sensitive tissue, sensitive issue that um, uh, one's careful in normal conversation um, as to who might be listening, who you might be talking to. Um, it's estimated now that one in three women over the age of 45 will have had an abortion, which is an enormous number. So if you're starting to have conversations within church, you've got to be very aware that there are people who are personally affected by this, whether it's women themselves, whether it's um, partners of women, whether it's grandparents, all sorts of issues are raised on a, per, on a pastoral personal level. And so you've got to feel confident to, to navigate some of those, um, I think. Um, and so people shy away from the topic, really. Um, I think, too, you know, there is a national, there's, there's that, that, that feeling torn. There is a natural compassion for the, for the injustices that mean that women sometimes find themselves in situations needing abortions. Um, and, but also knowing that surely God has created us in his image. What makes it different that we're a fetus in a womb rather than a six month old? Um, you know, all those sorts of, we, we just don't, we just don't, haven't really thought it through a bit like me before I started on this process sort of about three years ago. Yeah. And the response to your book, how's that been? Uh, well, as response to the book got a bit scuppered by COVID, really. Oh, of course. Yeah, the, <laughs> so, yeah a difficult time to release a new book in the world. <laughs> it was. Um, so there were lots of plans of sort of trying to, uh, and opportunities to speak at um, conferences and stuff like that, but they all got cancelled. And th there's been a bit, um, I've been so encouraged, actually. The most encouraging thing have been from women who've been running um, uh, pregnancy advice clinics or running training programmes who've, written to me and said um look this is the book we really wanted it's it's clear on the it's clear on the the rights and the wrongs of it but it also acknowledges um the need from compassion in a pastoral setting for women who are in tough positions um so that's been the biggest encouragement it's been translated into french and into spanish that was quite <laughs> that was quite a surprise for us um 
I think I wish it would have got into more hands. Definitely, I do. I do wish it had. Um, uh, we the was... nice thing is, once now that it's out there, it can only increase in the um, the readership of it. Yeah, I think so. And um, uh, yes, at times, some stage, it'll need a bit of updating. I guess we'll see. Mm. Well, um, why don't we just dive into the the early chapters of the book? And um, the the opening few chapters are are questions: Where are we? Who are we? And when are we human? Um, perhaps in just setting the kind of broader scene for us in the UK, where are, where are we at? Because I think for a lot of us, um, this feels like a noisy issue in America, and so we think wrongly this is an American issue or this is something yeah. the Americans are very animated about but mm. us Brits it's not something that affects us so mm. it's really lovely to, to actually read a, a British perspective on it um, but perhaps that our opening chapter where are we could you help just set the set the historic framework for us yes yeah, certainly well abortion is basically illegal in this country um, I don't think we sometimes realize that um, fundamentally the default is that it's illegal but um, the um, abortion act of 1967 makes it legal in certain circumstances um, and um, so, and there are various categories which doctors have to sign to say it's 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 legal in this situation um, and and because it's a legally um, sort of regulated um, uh, issue there are statistics gathered um, every year and you can google those and you can find them on the internet as to how many abortions are having being being done for what reason um, whether in private sector privately all sorts of different sort of um, uh, uh, factors you can look at um, but the bottom line is that um, the rate the number of abortions that are happening is increasing all the time ever since 1967 there's been a steady steady rise in fact it was a very steep rise it's a slower rise now but it is still increasing um, and there are now about 800 abortions done every single working day in this country. And I don't know, I find it difficult to, to, to get my head around that. I start thinking of the number of jumbo jets that would have to crash out of the sky every day for us to sort of wake up and realize what's happening or how many classrooms full of children would need to, um, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's just, just impossible to, to think of. Um, and that's not just the life that's that's the issue for the mother that's the issue for the family um there's all sorts of ramifications for that and within that 800 there are some interesting trends um we often think that abortion i think that's one of the things as well that we get from the media is that um you know surely this is something for young kids who've been raped who come from particularly difficult backgrounds um for whom life choices are now going to be completely altered all sorts of things well i'm not sure that that's entirely true the, the evidence is that it's in in the under 18s the in the frequency of abortion is reducing and it's only three percent of abortions that are done in under 18s 15% though are done in the over 35s and that level is increasing. Um, and there are reasons behind that, um, which I think are, are interesting and perhaps we can come on to, but it, but I think we need, to, we need to be, and we often think too, it's for, for, to save the life of the mother or to, or to, or because the child is severely disabled. Well, those things represent a tiny, tiny fraction of the number of abortions that are happening. Um, something like, well, I think to save the life of the mother, it's something like 0.04%. Um, for Because of abnormality, it's 2% um, of abortions. And even then, um, I don't know that I would feel that those abortions were justified on the basis. I don't think many people would. Um, several, uh, cleft lip and palate, for instance, are, 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 are one of the, the conditions that are Sort of highlighted by the statistics and i don't know if you know do you know people with cleft lip and palate i know several kids who've had operations early mm -hmm. in their childhood perfectly normal um but yeah, yes i think, you, I think you said it was um two hundred thousand abortions in um 20 when was that yeah it's over that now something like two thousand of two hundred and five thousand now and i understand during covid um there were a further relaxing in the the abortion pill being sent out by post is that right yeah, there was, but there's been some great news recently that um, it's been agreed that um, that will stop at the end of August. Oh, so right. the fear had been that um, because of COVID and folk not being able to go to clinics, um, that these pills could be sent in the post, um, abortions would happen at home, and um, women unsupported didn't need to tell anybody 
um, and dreadful really. Um, but the fear was that the pro-abortion lobby would would want that situation to continue. And then, then they did fight hard for it to continue. But mercifully, um, the government have decided that it will end at the end of August. So we'll be back to clinic-based abortions where at least women have some kind of contact and support. Yeah. Mm. You mentioned just then that uh, uh, abortions are increasing in the over 35s and you said yeah. there are some reasons for that. What are some of those reasons? Yeah, it's to do with antenatal screening, really, um, and early tests that mothers are offered in the antenatal clinic, which give them a probability of um, a, a child having conditions such as Down syndrome. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't quote me on the figures here, but for instance, if I was 25 and going to have this test, I would expect my chance of having a child with down syndrome to be something like one in 400. Um, now, if your test result comes back and that has shifted to one in 200, you're now thought to be at higher risk of having a child with Down syndrome for your age. And so then uh, there are further tests you could do. You could wait till about 16, 17 weeks and have something called amniocentesis to check out the facts of that matter. Or you could ch ch choose not to carry the risk and to have an early abortion at sort of eight or 10 weeks. And the fact of the matter is that when those when some of those statistics come back, when women are given some of those probabilities and they seem to them to be represent a higher risk and a risk that they don't want to take, people are choosing to have abortions rather than find out whether child has Down syndrome or, or what have you. And, you know, it says some fundamental things about what we really think about disability as a society. We have this public image of inclusivity. Uh, you know, every soap opera has somebody with a disability in it because that's seen as the right thing to do in public. And it is the right thing to do. <laughs> but what we're saying privately is that actually we don't value the disabled life mm. in, 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 in the way we'd like to think we do. Um, in Iceland, actually, there are no disabled children born, no Down syndrome children born because of this early antenatal testing and you know what it's not so hard for people for people like us who have a pro-life position to start making our voices heard just in the day-to-day -day of life in the antenatal clinic to make choices no I'm, I'm not going to have that test done I don't, don't even want the test well the answer could come back um, well you can have the test because it would you, help you to prepare for a child if you knew and that's a legitimate reason but just to start having those kinds of conversations with the medical um, world would be really great because things have shifted enormously since I was a doctor. Mm. Uh, a friend of a friend recently knew she was carrying a Down syndrome child. She was uh, a Christian. She was never going to have an abortion. And but even as she went into labor, she was told that she would, was, would be entitled to have an abortion on the basis mm. of a, an abnormality because people's mindsets have completely changed on this topic. Um, and we need to be aware and start having just gentle pushbacks and conversations and modeling a different way of life, a different, um, something distinctive as Christians, really, I think. Um, mm. on this so, I mean, you mentioned that, you know, that people's mindsets have changed on this issue. Um, and I, I remember I read a, a history book recently that about the Abortion Act and David Paynton, and it was very much presented as the much more humane and compassionate thing to do. And the, the, you know, like you said, your heart goes out to women who are facing impossible situations, seemingly. And it seems that the public mood has has turned very much in favour of compassion towards the mother's suffering. Um, and, you know, slogans like my body, my choice are almost seen as defeater arguments um, mm. that you think, well, of course, your body, your choice. Yes. Um, yeah. how, how I mean, I'd like to we'll come on in a moment to talk about whether or not pro-life, pro-choice are even useful labels. But um what what's your observations as to why society's mood or opinion on this has changed so much and uh, and what you think the church needs to do to try to help present an alternative to that mood or just your reflections on on that um yeah i think we do naturally yeah there is something that sounds right doesn't it about my body my choice um and i think oh there's so much so much background we could go back to <laughs> <laughs> to the patriarchy and misogyny and feminism. Let's go there. Go on then. Well, uh, <laughs> well, well, we know we know biblically, don't we, that um, you know there is the battle of the sexes, and um, we live under the curse of the fall, and um, women have been um, oppressed and ill-treated. That's where domestic violence comes from. That's where human trafficking comes from. 
that's where some of the situations that women find themselves in um, when they need an abortion um, uh, come from. Um, and I think, you know, second wave feminism had a, loads of fantastic stuff um, as part of it. But one of its strands, and it got aligned with, was this desire to separate uh, the, in order for the woman to have equal workplace opportunities, she really needed to separate herself from her biology because childbirth and pregnancy and um, uh, caring for children, you know, interrupted those opportunities or threatened those opportunities. And so, so it was aligned and there were big pushes to, to both on with the contraceptive pill was part of it. And, um, but abortion rights was also a big part of it. Um, so there's that um, on a big level. Um, I think also though on a very so where society where societies come from I, th I think that's that's been that's been a huge push um I th I think we shouldn't be shy of steering away from the fact that early pro-abortion lobbies were eugenicists I think and you know what we've just said about disability um I think is is a common thread amongst the pro-abortion lobby or a, a, just a nasty dark bit of the history to it mm -hmm. um and it and it has raised its head it's eugenics now with down syndrome babies uh, and I, th I don't think we should be shy of saying that um i think the problem is as well is that we don't want to face the truth um i think and there's not many people who know that there are 800 abortions every day there's not many people who know that the 98 percent of them are done for reasons where it's, it's judged to be in the for the better mental health of the woman than continuing with the pregnancy. Um, and that's such a loose category that can be applied in so many ways. I don't think we appreciate really too, I'm not sure, I mean, we, we get back to these terms, pro-life, pro-choice. I'm not sure the pro-choice lobby really do offer choice. Uh, even for the women who don't have choice, those who they'd want to be offering the service to. Um, you know, I sometimes think of um, situations of women who find themselves unexpectedly pregnant um maybe in a cultural situation um I, I don't know this is this is to use extreme cases again which i often criticize other people for using <laughs> but to but the illegal immigrant who's here without access to benefits who who's at the mercy of the men in her life and she finds herself pregnant and does she have a choice does she the abortion as um clinic is not is happy to service what they see as her need but do they really expand her choice? Do they really offer her the opportunity to oh, for holistic care? If I think of some organizations like Life Charity, where they have homes for uh, women who are in vulnerable positions, where, they, where they'll provide job training, all sorts of holistic care for a woman as they support her to go through a pregnancy she, she actually really wants to keep. I don't, I don't think the pro-choice lobby is pro-choice. It doesn't expand a woman's choice. It's not pro-women really um uh in a yeah. wider sense of the word yeah uh, the, the criticism though can is often put back that the pro-life lobby aren't pro-life they're just pro-birth and mm. um, you you address this in your book actually which i think it was really helpful can you speak into into that criticism and what you think the answer should be well i think i think I think the art, I think there are so many ways of responding to this topic. I mean, in the book, we've got this sort of tree diagram, I'm not sure, um, which just sort of says there's so many roots to this problem. And there's so many results of it, of abortion having impacted our society. And there are so many ways in which we can interact on the issue with either the roots or the, or the results, really, mm. uh, or the fruit. And um, I... I'm sorry, I've, my train of thought has got a bit lost. Just repeat the question again. No, it was, it was just the, the pushback in your book, really, to the pro-life, yeah, pro-birth, oh, yeah. pro pro-life, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think, I, think, I think that's a criticism that we have to take. Um, I think sometimes we've got very moral about it and not being, have, not being prepared to get down in the muck of people's lives and, and really walk alongside them as they, as they go through the decision-making process, as they deal with relationships in the families as they think about their situation of bringing up children what what do we do after the birth you know how do, how do we support and care for that um i think yeah uh and i i would love to see and and there are organizations who um 
who are, are doing, like I said, like Life Charity, who are doing a great job. But local churches could be doing more on that front. The problem is for local churches is that, um, uh, well, the, the thinking about local churches is those within the congregation and those outside, I think, churches within the congregation, Christian kids facing an unwanted pregnancy. I think it's still so highly stigmatized. Um, we've just got to start talking about it because uh, without that, I just don't think it's going to be, I think it's going to be high, very, very difficult to really offer the kind of care that you want to. Abortion seems such a quick solution. It's so easily available uh, that it seems so easy to um, go down that route then you don't have to face everything else. So I do think talking about it is, is one, of the, one of the best things you can do. Um, I was just thinking as well, as you were talking, my mind was going off to this idea of just pro-birth. I think there are some clinics starting up around the UK um, who, based on a philosophy, uh, really, or just aware that if a mother actually sees her child on an ultrasound scan, that alters the dynamics of her decision. Um, now, if you go to an abortion clinic, you will have an ultrasound scan, but the screen will be turned away. You you won't be you won't be you won't see your child. It will be it. It's not him him or her. If you go to an antenatal clinic, your screen will, it's the same situation. The screen will be turned towards you. You'll be counting the fingers and thumbs, wondering whether it's a boy or a girl. You know, all this. There's sort of an emotional bond happening. And once that emotional bond happens, um, I think it it's it well it reveals truth, doesn't it? I mean, it's part of the argument of seeing pictures. It it makes it evident of what is actually going on. Um, so these clinics around the country, these sort of um, pro life clinics, are starting to offer women ultrasound scans as part of their um, counselling um, in this in the face of unwanted pregnancy, and they're finding that. The, the, the numbers of women who in the end decide not to have an abortion, uh, the numbers of women who decide to have an abortion is reducing because the women have started to engage with the life that's, that's within them. And the other interesting thing is, although they're set up to offer this all this ongoing support for all this other stuff, actually it hasn't been as needed as it seemed pre, uh, pre-scan, if you know what I mean, or pre-decision. I think you know, we're all when we when we want to make a decision, we justify it in all sorts of ways. And when we've made another decision, some of those justifications go away. Um, it's um, we do need to be around for these women, but it's not the majority of women who are in such dire straits um, that they need huge amounts of ongoing support afterwards. Mm. I hope that doesn't sound uncompassionate. I think it's the fact of the matter when there's 800 a day, um, there will be a tiny proportion. You want to be there for that tiny proportion. You really do have very relevant practical needs. Mm -hmm. But for others, uh, they have the resources within their own circles, within their families, once their decision is made. Yeah. I mean, how, what I find in, in the conversation, is, and I'm talking to an, another friend, is that it, it can very quickly in discussions about this come down to a battle of the stories um, this person's a story of being in dire straits versus this person's story of being saved from an abortion now being a fully grown adult able to say you know abortions are bad um, but it seems actually as Christians we we have to find a more sure footing in this conversation don't we than than the stories the plausibility stories of whether or not you know what so walk us through perhaps that for those who have maybe not not really heard much of a, a case or given it too much thought. walk us through the bible's case um for when life starts or why we shouldn't why why this is it because so here's the thing when i became a christian from a non-christian background it was one of those things i kind of stumbled across like oh now i'm a christian we we don't we don't we're pro-life oh okay uh, why <laughs> and you kind of as a christian you kind of get just swept up oh, fine so perhaps for those who might be in a situation like i was um would you mind just taking it back to first principles for us yeah and i think we've also got to acknowledge that there are that there are people who are christ who are thoughtful christians who perhaps don't take the view that that i would take um but and uh, you we also do hear the comments well you know the bible doesn't say much about abortion <laughs> and in some ways that's true it doesn't say that thou shalt not have an abortion um 
it says an awful, awful lot about the love of God and his forgiveness. And one thing I always try to make sure is very clear um, when I speak on this topic or in, in our conversation now uh, to anyone who's listening who may have had an abortion. The Bible says a lot more about the love of God for those whose lives have got messy and are messed up, who turn to him and forgive him. They, you know, Romans 8, chapter, verse 1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, wherever we've come from. And abortion certainly isn't the unforgiveness certainly is not the unforgivable sin in any sense of the word so i'd want to start i want to start there with the love of god um i'd want to acknowledge that um uh it doesn't say explicitly that i shall not have an abortion Mm. but i want to say that the the general tenor of scripture is assumed that life starts preconception life starts pre-birth and moves through not just into our life as we're experiencing now but beyond death into the resurrection. Um, I think it's, it's just hinted at in several places, the where, you know, Samson was a Nazarite from the womb. Um, it, Jeremiah was known before he was born. Um, the story of Mary visiting Elizabeth um, uh, after, after birth, uh, uh, before Jesus was born rather. And, um, and John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb, leaping for joy as he sort of met the Lord Jesus. <laughs> uh, in a sort of pre-birth sort of setting um now whatever you think of that uh, you know it it just seems that the bible assumes that life is going on before individuals come out of the womb uh this psalm 139 which talks is talks hugely about being made in the uh you know uh, fearfully and wonderfully made talks about being made in the womb um, and looks beyond. I think one of the most compelling things for me, though, is to think of the Lord Jesus himself. We would never assume that he was not human when he was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, as we say in all our creeds. So as the Holy Spirit, he, as, as Mary conceived the Lord Jesus by the Holy Spirit, Jesus became man at that moment. And he, we, I don't think we would ever deny that. Um, He lived his earthly life and he's risen, the firstborn from among the dead. Um, And we will follow in his footsteps. This is this is the model. This is this is where we're going. I think that's that's that is where I would argue it from. I could I think biblically, I think the um, philosophically, I think I would I just think any other situation is a complete is is potentially so messy. We end up. Um, trying to decide if someone is human based on what they can do or their capacities or their capabilities that raises issues not only for the beginning of life but for the end of life as well obviously Um, and we then start getting into well is someone's worth life valuable uh, because of what they can do or what they can achieve how they can contribute that's never the gospel the gospel is all about love and uh, being given to us because how God has declared us to be made in his image um, is not never dependent on our worth. It's dependent on our God who's merciful and gracious to us. So it just seems so antithetical to the gospel to me to be thinking along any other sort of um, philosophical. Yeah, the, I framework. mean, that was, it was quite um terrifying really some of the the places that people go with this but it seems to me that the discussions moved on from that where where does life begin at conception it's moved on from there to when does a when does a life become a person is that right yeah that's what you're alluding to just then can you explain that one for us yes i think it's it's when it's yes it is this separating out of humans so most most of most scientists would now agree that um uh embryo is a embryonic human um but yes it's when when someone becomes a person uh, and that so has inherent worth um and that that could be anything from um uh uh well i would be i would be calling a, a fetus a person um but others might not really think that someone becomes a person until they can contribute uh, in in a way so is a baby a person you know there's this word agencies used do they have agency well does a baby have agency when he's dependent on his mother or he or she is dependent on on the mother all the time or the father um so yes it all gets it all gets all gets very messy and confused yeah mm. so it seems um 
yeah, I'm, I'm trying to work out where, where's the best place to take it from here because there's lots of hmm, what was I going to what was I going to say? So how, here's the here, here's the question. Let me, so my friend is a my friend is a midwife and a Christian, philosophically pro-life, mm. in a vocation that is almost committedly pro-choice, um, mm. because of many of the reasons you said that um, women have been oppressed and uh, their agency and you know uh, their their autonomy. Their, what's the word I'm looking for? They haven't had control over their own body and people have taken that away from them and so the the whole profession of midwifery is there to empower a woman's choice and so i think you can know the question that's coming i'll find a better way of wording it in the edit <laughs> what would you say to my friend and others who are working in the medical profession or as christians who just feel this kind of real tug between philosophically i know this is right but vocationally i'm kind of committed to this and um what yeah what would be some of your advice to people like that um, well, I think it's a bit like what I was talking about earlier when I was a GP, you know, how did I, how did I end up handling it? Well, I, um, and, and some, and I, I just thinking about how to go with this answer, because I sometimes, my mind automatically goes back to Daniel in the Old Testament, when he sort of, he sort of found himself in a situation where he had potentially had influence, um, but he had bottom lines, which he wouldn't cross in terms of you know food he would eat and stuff like that and it's that's that sort of idea that i would i would think about so um we have to acknowledge that we're living we're aliens in a fallen land but like daniel was you know we're living in in a context which it's not home and um and it's the now not yet uh, mm -hmm. so we have to we have to operate in the mess of lies now and we and as christians we may well make different decisions so i as a gp for instance i knew that some of my friends wouldn't even see uh, christian friends wouldn't see felt they couldn't see people requesting an abortion on the other hand i chose to see them and have uh, and felt that i was able to um have influence uh, in a way like that my bottom line rather than not seeing them was that i wouldn't sign their forms to say that i supported the decision um and similarly i think for, for your friend who's a midwife i think she's there's a sense in which we have to accept that we're working in uncomfortable situations um that is going to be the norm for christians who are working in these areas um while we're still on earth <laughs> um but at the same time she needs to discuss with others prayerfully consider where her bottom line is where she is going to be distinctive from maybe the another uh, midwifery colleague um, and it may be in how she um, raises the topic of abortion. Now, I've had a friend recently who's a Christian mum who, well, she's not yet had the baby. She's not yet a mum, but she's pregnant for the first time in her early 40s. So she's a high risk pregnancy. Um, and every time she goes to the antenatal clinic, she's asked whether she would like tests and whether she'd like an, because, because she could have an abortion because it's part of the procedure. Um, and she's actually come out of the NHS now and gone to see a private obstetrician because she just feels it's so unhelpful for her in terms mm -hmm. of developing a health, healthy, healthy relationship with her baby at this stage. She, just, she doesn't want to go there. But there are ways in which a Christian midwife in the NHS could perhaps circumnavigate some of those conversations, um, even with the phrase. Now, I'm obliged to ask you this. I realize that this is this is perhaps something which you, you know, you you'll find difficult to hear. But have you do you do you realize that? that you know you're at higher risk of a child with an abnormality um the law does provide you with the opportunity to consider abortion if that was the case uh, you might add that often women don't, don't don't decide that that's not for them and that's fine so you give them the outs to make them feel that you mm. know a christian choice in those situations is normal because actually when you go to these situate these clinics the majority of the time you're felt to feel very abnormal um if you're holding a christian line Mm. or you consider having a child and not going through all the testing and all that sort of stuff so to be the to be the the wonderful midwife would allow you to express your views um in an nhs situation could be could be pots could be could be wonderful but yeah. our consciences are all different and we might make different decisions but yeah. i think it boils down to the fact that acknowledging we're going to it's going to be difficult and working out for ourselves what our bottom line is where we're going to be distinctive yeah mm. it's, like you said it's part of the challenge being a christian means that we're 
we, we're living in the grey. We're, li we're yeah. living as exiles, as aliens and strangers in a foreign land, knowing yeah. how God created it and how he's going to end it and finding ourselves in this story, the, the now but not yet, as you put it. It was, uh, it was interesting to me. I watched a, a video in preparation for this from Planned Parenthood, which is the American um, organisation, uh, healthcare provider. Uh, mm. The video is entitled Moving Beyond Pro-Life and Pro-Choice. And at the end, it said, decisions about abortion ought to be down to the woman her family and her faith with the counsel of her doctor or healthcare provider, which of course we would, we would agree with in part um, that it is a woman's decision, but it just strikes me that like you were saying there with, with the counsel of her doctor or healthcare provider, well, they seem to be weighted towards pro-choice and, mm -hmm. and, and the, the, the cynic in me uh, is aware as well that this is a, a multi-million pound industry for those who provide abortions as well. So it's not a neutral issue um, for the NHS. It's not a neutral issue for those who provide it. They, they need this service to still be there, I suppose. Um, well, let's come to some, just some other questions that kind of, I think are linked to this, that are relevant to the conversation. Um, this is often, how much is, the, how much is the sexual revolution to blame for this? And how much is this really a result of our desire to have sex without strings um, and we're now living in a society where we think our sexuality is such a core part of our identity and who we are that to restrict or limit that in any way you know like you mentioned really we're living um, in the wake of these philosophies that have changed that we're kind of the, the pandora is out of the box or pandora's box is open and um and how much is the is it to how much is it the sexual revolution? How much is it just the invention of the contraception, the contraceptive pill, um, oh. birth control? Um, but and, and now that as I said, so is this really? Because so a lot of pro choices would say that this is on the face of it, it's an issue about abortion, but it's really about you trying to limit who I can and can't have sex with. That actually, you Christians have this strict, you know conservative view when it comes to sex and sexuality and that's the real problem here um and then you use these other th these other things to kind of justify that that's a lot there i just would appreciate your comments and reflections on any of that i'm not expecting you to yes yeah, you say there's a lot there i think one of the things that um we have done culturally i mean um is this thing called gnosticism you know there's this sort of separation of, of us a disintegration of us as as human beings so in one sense the, the sort of the gnostic thing is that you know i am not my body so my body can carry on and have pleasure but it doesn't actually sort of connect with the rest of it um but also i think in the way we have disintegrated our gender our sexuality um uh from who we are you know i mean i i think there's the whole whole thing we're just sort of fractured and it's as if there are different parts of us and actually part of the work of the gospel is to reintegrate us um to uh bring uh how we're made into align with our purpose um and i i think i'm getting a bit jumbled up here but i i i think we've just got so fractured in terms of our body mind and soul that we just and we and i can see the i can see the argument if we're if we're all fractured and we just want to have fun mm. but actually it's it's not how we were fundamentally created to be we were created to be integrated with a purpose and i think it goes right back to genesis one you know be fruitful uh, and multiply procreation is a fundamental part of who we are and how we're made. Um, and that's why I think fundamentally, as I hinted right back at the beginning, is abortion is such, such a violent thing for a woman. Um, it's not that everybody is gonna have children like myself. I've never had children, I've not been married. I, you know, it's not that, that women don't do other wonderful things. I mean, I spent my life doing lots of other, other things, um, but um, there is something very fundamental and we've just fractured everything, I think. Mm. Um, it's, it was, we're living in a, an age where, perhaps the sex education of our children uh, increasingly younger and younger ages is peddling this same message that um, you should be free to do whatever you want sexually and uh, actually and your adults your parents you don't even call them parents your adults at home shouldn't have the ultimate say in what you do um, even from a young age mm -hmm. and it seems that then we're we're really just downstream of of that ideology that we're trying to you know, save babies from being killed um, downstream of those who are educating our children saying you should just have sex with whoever you want and 
and like you alluded to in second wave feminism's kind of uh, assault on the human person and actually a war against biology that I uh, think that, that you know that it's oppressive that women have to be the ones who bear this burden and men don't and they want to you know deny that sex distinction entirely we just I, and that's where I think it's just really it becomes really difficult you well how do we how do we solve this problem um because given yeah I don't know what is a holistic response that Christians ought to be and churches ought to be really engaging in well certainly education in schools is one thing um <laughs> Do you think we should be lobbying schools a lot more to change um, ed sex education? I think certainly getting involved in it is is important. Um, and the role of, you know, teachers, Christian teachers or TAs in, in the classroom and stuff like that. Um, yeah. I, 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 I mean, I, I go back to this life charity organization. They also they also go into schools and do sort of training sessions and six forms and stuff like that and talk about all these issues. Um, other organizations with Christian curricula on sort of sex education and the rest of it. Um, mm. Yeah. I, yes. <laughs> I, you almost feel you almost feel, oh, there's so much. There is so much to do. Um, mm. So how do you, I guess perhaps a good question is then, how do you stop yourself just feeling overwhelmed and impotent in the face of such a such, you know, 200,000 and increasing year on year, 800 a day? How do you, I don't know, how, how, how we can't carry that, that kind of trauma and information without it causing us to go to strange places. How do you process that? And what do you think is a healthy way to, to be in the world? Well, I think that, um for us as christians we the idea that, that we, we need to keep our eyes fixed on the lord jesus you know under whom uh, under whose control all things are um and who has already reconciled everything through his death and resurrection so we there's a sense of confidence in that not just in a intellectual way but in a day-to-day -day way as well because he's the world he's the guy that holds all things together who is like orchestrating everything behind the tapestry of our individual lives and we can only do what is in front of us um, and we can put our next step in front of us. So I had the opportunity to write the book. So that was my that's my contribution to the thing. I haven't got lots of experience of setting up a pro-life center or an early pregnancy center. That's a wonderful thing to do. But other people will have the passion and the desire and the heart for that. Um, I don't do things quite in the same way with images and stuff like that. But other people do. And they have the heart and the passion for that. And we all need to be given that freedom to to do that. I, I absolutely think we must pray you alluded to some you know the response of the book i think this is um this is dark territory this is ter this whole abortion thing is absolutely horrendous and there's a spiritual battle going on mm -hmm. and i think that's part of the challenge that we had with, with writing the book it's part of the challenge the reason that pro different pro-life organizations actually some, sometimes find it a bit difficult to work together we've got to be we've got to be praying into this issue big time um, and then it, empowering others and giving people the opportunity to um, to to get on and do do things that God prompts God puts on their heart to do. Um, and I do think it's we ought to be signing up and supporting other organisations that are that are involved with advocacy, lobbying government. I mean, I've never written so many letters to my MP based on um right to life uh, uh, organization often these charities are not particularly christian on the face of it they're, but they're loaded with christians behind the scenes um uh, because as you've alluded to the faith thing becomes a bit of an issue for people and people think well just because you're christians you you're moralizing and telling us how we should behave um i think uh yeah so i think one for pray one foot in front of the other don't lose heart because god has got it and um uh yeah yeah, I think that's a really helpful. Care for the individuals. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a really um, just helpful reminder as well that a we're not the Messiah, <laughs> but b we're part of a body. And it's recovering that body idea that um, that's, that's linked to the first one. You're not the savior, but you are part of a body, and every part in the body has a different part to play. But mm -hmm. the question we all ought to be asking is, what's my part to play in this issue, and what's the yeah, Lord calling really me helpful. to do? Yeah. Um, well, I know this this isn't linked to that that one there, but it's something I've often wrestled with. And you hear this regularly. As a man, 
I'm told I'm not allowed to talk about this and it's not yeah. my issue. It's a woman's issue. So actually it'd be quite offensive for some people that I'm even asking you these questions and daring to talk about this with a woman. What would your comment be to that? I think, well, that's, that opens a whole nother can of worms. But I think that that speaks into how some, our thinking on gender has got corrupted as a society and um, men and women have both have roles to play there's a unity in our genders but a distinction in our roles and i think sometimes those have been abrogated and what we need is good men to stand up to stand up um and to model what it means to treat women well um and to commit to women in marriage and all sorts of things um and i want to hear your voice is what i want to say <laughs> um because uh and it's great to see the number of men who are engaged in this debate. Mm -hmm. um, I think they do need to be wise and sensitive um, because uh, they are never the ones who are going to carry the, the load of an unwanted pregnancy. Um, so I think they need to proactively be seeking out women to stand alongside them and help them in the role. And sometimes, sadly, I don't see that happening. Um, and I wish we'd do, it, we'd do that more. Um, Mm. Yeah. yeah that because there needs to be a humility to understand that they, they they don't actually understand but at the same time they need to be involved in the debate and christian men modeling what it means to to love and support uh women care for their families mm. treat women well yeah yeah because i that's what i was going to say i was um that I, i'm aware that the, the the reason behind people would say oh you don't you can't speak in this because i don't carry the burden of this um i'm not I, on the face of it at least for those the trauma of this is going to be felt by the women but it also seems to me that the way society has got to is that it with our our attitudes towards sex is that it, it seems to serve the men most anyway we overlook the fact that women are always going to be the more vulnerable partner in a sexual encounter because they're always the ones who bear the risk of having to live with the consequences of this in a way that men don't. Yeah, that's so a really helpful way of looking at it. It seems to yeah. me that the sexual revolution was promised to liberate women, but has actually just given men what they always wanted, which was, you know, um, sex without consequences. And yeah. actually now we, now we don't even have to get married to the woman. We can just have sex. And actually the women's magazines promote this, this vision of sexuality for women that seems to me a very masculine vision. That is just lots of irresponsible, carefree sex. When it's, it's never like that for women um, and that, that isn't going to change unless the unless our biology changes which is um what what you were alluding to earlier with the comments on second wave feminism um any further comments on that <laughs> on, on the sexual revolution and men and women no i think that's a really really helpful way of, of putting it um thinking of women's vulnerability in the context of sexual re um relationships yeah um yeah one of the things that strikes me in this debate too is we talk we talk it's a bit of a sort of a shift in our conversation but we talk a lot about vulnerability and women being vulnerable but we often don't think about the vulnerability of the unborn child and um or and widen it given what's happening with disability to the vulnerability of disabled people and what it says about us as how we care for those who are most vulnerable um and we'd hope the church would be the, the prime model, obviously. Um, but I think it is a challenge to society. It's really hard to know how to speak into this issue in society. Um, but one thing would be, one way of doing it would be to talk around the issue of vulnerability. And you can acknowledge the vulnerability of women. I mean, there's, there's truth in feminist arguments and women do find themselves in vulnerable situations in, in many ways. Um, and, that, and to acknowledge that, to acknowledge the, right, the wrongness of, people being unnecessarily vulnerable um but then to question the vulnerability of unborn children there can't be anything more vulnerable really no it's, it's the perhaps most, a newborn yeah. child yeah it's the most dangerous time in your life isn't it the time where you're at least yeah and most at risk is can't when do anything. yeah can't do anything and actually what what babies need is people to speak out for them um in a society that seems to you know i remember a friend putting it like this years ago he said um you you can tell what a society worships by the sacrifices it's willing to make and we worship sex and so therefore justify the sacrifice of babies because mm. we worship sex and we think it's it's ultimate in our lives 
And I think, again, Christians need to recover uh, and promote and celebrate um, sex as God, sex as good, but not God um, mm. in a society that does treat sex as God and ultimate. Um, it just seems so hard when we're, we're decades downstream from people like Freud, who said almost exactly what our flesh wanted them to say. They gave a scientific rationale um, for what our sinful nature has always wanted. Oh, you know, <laughs> legitimate, selfish indulgence of sexual appetites. Um, but, but it also gets back to this idea is, you know, well, we don't actually do what we think is right most of the time. We can have all these philosophical, it's what it's not what we think is right that we do, it's what we want to do that we do. I and mean, you know, it's and so there's the heart, there's there's lots of there's lots of ways of talking about this, which I think lead to conversations about that call for repentance, that call for an acknowledgement of the God who made us and who has plans that are good for us. And yeah. Um so that's partly why that's partly why I enjoy is perhaps the wrong word talking about abortion. But I do think it begs the question, is God big enough to handle this kind of issue, the whole complexity of it? And I come to a very firm conclusion that he is, whether it's the philosophical stuff, whether it's the intellectual arguments, whether it's the pastoral care. Uh, we serve a God who is loving and gracious and merciful, who is strong, mighty to save. And, you know, Sometimes we can, I mean, this is, a, this is a lifelong learning process, isn't it? For it to move from our head knowledge to something that we really come to depend on mm. day by day in our hearts. And coping with an unwanted pregnancy is a real challenge. Uh, but God is bigger than that challenge. And um, I'd want to hope to be helping and walking alongside women, helping them to know God in the midst of really difficult times and to know him to be faithful and good and true. Um, yeah. Oh man, I mean that's that's probably just a really healthy place and helpful place to leave it, recognizing the great courage that's required of women to bring children into the world, but also recognizing that God is big enough to help them in this situation. I think it, it strikes me that once a woman becomes pregnant, that becomes a life-defining moment, regardless of which direction they take it. It's not as, as from your book as well. It's clear it's not as though having an abortion gets rid of all the negative consequences that might have been associated with that pregnancy. Um, and actually, then what is what's needed is courage and faith to trust God and, uh, and probably the compassion and support systems of people in your life to help. Um, Lizzie, as we draw things to a close, are there other things that's on your mind at the moment that you'd like to leave us with? Um. I don't think so, in particularly in relation to this issue, are you thinking? I'll take anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, one is I'm really grateful that those DIY abortions are going to stop at the end of August. I'm so pleased that should encourage us to, to speak out and places like Right, right, right for Life um, uh, websites and stuff send you email triggers. And it's just such a privilege to think that those buttons that I pressed to send an email to my MP might have had some influence. So we shouldn't give up. We shouldn't. We should still keep our voice being heard. And, you know, who, whose mind isn't on Ukraine at the moment? Um, you know, so, 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 so tragic. And I just feel for those women and children. I mean, in some ways, and you might want to edit this out, I don't know, we'll see. But in some ways, we've seen modeled in the Ukrainian response, a responsibility of men to protect and care for vulnerable people, women, which I think I, I'm in some ways, you know, I'm impressed by. I think um, very painful, isn't it? But um, I see the men stepping up and taking responsibility and caring for those who are more vulnerable. And it is the women who will be looking after the kids who need that protection. Um, but in the meantime, yeah many of them so very much on my heart at the moment i think that's, that's that is yeah i think my wife and i as this came on the news a few weeks ago now and we started thinking about it i think i felt more alarmed and concerned than she did early on because i think i'm aware of that dynamic that should this escalate i know my responsibility as a man is different than hers and although actually in a society that likes to erase distinctions between the sexes like you said war is probably a good good time where all of the philosophical chaff <laughs> gets blown to one side and 
what what is deepest what, what is most true that we believe most about humanity comes to the surface um mm. both good bits and bad bits but i think this is one of those things that very quickly comes to the surface men feel an innate responsibility to mm. fight and sacrifice themselves for their families and, and women feel an innate responsibility to be those primary caregivers for the for the young and that's not oppressive that's not immoral no. it's not saying one's better than the other or one's but you could, hard, you could hardly other. say that these days without no. getting cancelled out really no but it seems that war <laughs> at times yeah. of war think, Look, think it's obvious <laughs> yeah a lot of our isms fall to the ground <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, as we realize the the truth and that's why i think the, the bible is such a beautiful profound book because um just at a very simple level it is the kind of distillation of human wisdom through the jet through the ages that has stood the test of time and the reason it stood the test of time is because it is most true uh, about everything that we believe it doesn't come and go with fads and fashions what it says about human beings stands the test of time um and so yeah i do echo that that's that statement there and we've been praying for them and we'll continue to pray for what's going on in russia and ukraine who yeah. knows where the situation will be when by the time this airs uh, god knows and we know that he is um the author and finisher of all things including human history we can trust him yeah um well dr lizzie thank you so much for your time today it's been a real privilege and pleasure to talk with you and um if people wanted to find out more about your work or or get in touch with you of course i can recommend they read the book but is there anything in particular that you'd encourage people to do um yeah i've sort of mentioned a few things as i've gone along sort of check out some of the if you to, just think and pray how you want to be involved. Um, Life Charity is great. It's giving a sort of wide breadth of different sorts of things. You could, different avenues you could go, but there may be local expressions, local local groups, local, um, um, uh, but I'd also sign up for an advocacy thing so you know what's going on politically and they really do a great job at helping you um, liaise with, GP, with um, MPs and stuff like that. Um, and Right to Life would be the one I'd recommend. Excellent. Thank you so much.